Hello, my name is David Gotts, and I'm the founder of International China Concern. Earlier this year, I hosted a special virtual fundraising event for ICC offices all around the world. Many of our friends and long-term supporters loved this presentation so much, they wanted to share it with their friends. So it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this special condensed presentation that highlights the stories featured in the Black Tie and Fuzzy Slippers Gala. Throughout this video, you will hear mention of fundraising, the name of the gala, and even several visuals of fuzzy slippers, as these are highlight clips taken from the event. So sit back, relax, and let's enjoy our time together as we visit with the children and the staff of ICC. If you're an old friend of ICC watching right now, I invite you to see the fruits and results of your generosity and prayers. These are the precious lives that you have changed. Now, for those of you that are new to ICC, we hope that you will see how you too can change the lives of hundreds of young people that are still waiting to receive love. I was told by some of the people who saw our previous gala that they'd like to know a little bit more of me and my journey with ICC. So for those new friends, I'm humbled and delighted to be able to share with you a little bit of my personal journey and the beginning of International China Concern. God gave me the vision for ICC 27 years ago during a visit to a Chinese orphanage or welfare centre. I still remember that visit like it was yesterday. Arriving into that welfare centre to visit a friend of mine who was working there. Walking into the courtyard and feeling and sensing that eerie silence. Children just sitting on the floors like ragdolls, not really moving or playing. I remember walking into the baby room and seeing rows of cribs and looking into each crib there were four or five babies. And I learned that day that children with disabilities were being abandoned at a huge rate. So much so that many of the welfare centres just simply couldn't cope with the number of babies that were arriving. And so there were four, five in every crib. As I looked into the faces of these babies, many of them were covered in skin diseases. It was evident that they were neglected and malnourished. It was very clear to me that they were dying. Looking into these babies' eyes, I saw something that I'd never seen before. I saw babies who were no longer responding. They'd given up crying because nobody would come to comfort them. I walked into a toddler's room and saw toddlers sat in metal frame chairs, tied at the wrists and at the feet, unable to move, and they sat there for 14 hours a day. And in a back courtyard were older children with disabilities, also sitting on potty chairs over open drains with rats running round their feet. And I specifically remember kneeling down and looking into the eyes of one young child and realising that that light of life had gone out of the eyes of that child. These children were waiting for death. I remember going back to my room that evening and praying and asking God, how can this situation exist? I remember praying, God, where is your church? Where are the people that will come and make a difference? And of course, it was in that moment that God spoke to me and said, David, you're here. What will you do? Well, I have to tell you that I struggled with that challenge from God. I struggled for nine months until one day I came to the place where I knew that I needed to respond to this challenge and invitation. And when I did, God planted a dream in my heart, a dream where every child born with a disability in China can receive the care and the love and the support that they need. Well, of course, it's been 27 years since I first saw that terrible suffering and much has changed in China. But in this area, the care of children with disabilities, there has still been little progress. In fact, sometimes progress has been so slow that there is barely enough to keep children alive. 
The reality is that there are so many children and families waiting for the care that ICC offers. So our vision in ICC is for children with disabilities to be able to live a full and meaningful life in China, just the kind of life that we would want our children or grandchildren to be able to live. If you're interested to know more about that story at the beginning of ICC, we recently published a book called China's Oasis. It tells the story and the history of ICC, and more importantly, the faithfulness of God. And that book's available for purchase through your local ICC office. Through ICC's work, we see children's lives transformed. Hence our invitation to you tonight to come and see what joy looks like. You're going to be with us as we watch and hear stories about children moving from sadness of being neglected and forgotten and unloved, to laughing and playing and being full of joy. And this is why we in ICC love the work that we do. Well, we have an exciting programme ahead. Here's what's going to be coming up. She's a world-class violinist and a mother raising a child with a disability. Ninkam brings us an exclusive personal performance tonight. Meet the families who face extreme challenges with great love, hope and incredible determination. I was born with a disability. I was born missing the lower portion of my leg and I wear a prosthetic. It's a pleasure to also introduce to you an ICC ambassador who made a remarkable discovery during a visit to meet the children that ICC cares for. And success comes in many forms. You'll meet a young woman who has surpassed her own goals with the help of a global family. I'm so excited to get to share the stories of the children we serve, our staff and those who stand with ICC as we seek to help even more children. Well, during this time, we're going to be highlighting two specific aspects of ICC's work. Firstly, you're going to see the care that we provide to children who have been abandoned due to having a disability. With ICC, they're given a home and a family to belong to, a hope and a future. And they're also given an opportunity to learn life skills, vocational skills, and eventually find a job that can optimise their independence. Then we're going to share with you a little more about ICC's Family Partners Programme. This is the first of its kind in China. And you're going to learn about how it's helping transform the lives of children with disabilities, but not just the children, how it's strengthening their entire families and keeping them together. Thousands of families are still waiting for help to arrive. Now, let's get back to the amazing children and young people that ICC serves. I'd like to introduce you to a young woman, to Wang Hua. She's a very special young woman that I've known for 26 years. When I first visited the Changsha Welfare Centre, Wang Hua was one of the first children that I met 27 years ago. Wang Hua has cerebral palsy and due to neglect has simply lain on a bed for years with no care, no therapy and no support. Wang Hua's limbs were so stiff and twisted she could barely move. She couldn't speak and she was wasting away. This is Wang Hua's story. Chi 
。我现在的工作是把弟弟妹妹的成长报告输入在电脑上。我现在在办公室工作，我觉得我有能力打字。感谢爱心人士，也关注我们，嗯，感谢他们带给我们关爱。Today, Wanghua lives in one of ICC's community homes with several of the girls and has become their big sister. It's a loving family-style environment that allows her to serve as a role model for the younger girls. As you can see, Wanghua is well loved by her sisters. There are more than enough hugs to go around in Wangpa's family. As I see this, I'm struck by the incredible contrast between the Wangpa that I met back in the welfare centre in 1994 and the confident young woman that Wangpa is today. The long-held dream of working in an office has now been achieved. Wangpa recently joined the staff of our Family Partners program in Changsha. Within a few short weeks. Wang Hua was helping launch a new enrichment program for children with disabilities, passing on the blessing that she has received to others. The Family Partners Program team love Wang Hua's infectious enthusiasm. She is a valued member of the team and is a real blessing to parents and children who visit our program. They can see what is possible with faith and determination. Well, 呃，喜乐，谢谢，感谢 A P P， 呃，我永远爱你。I love that through the generosity of people like you, we've been able to give Wang Hua not only the opportunity to live, but to be loved and to learn and to develop the kind of skills that have now enabled her to have a job, giving her the dignity. And the independence that she needs and wants. In fact, helping her realise her dream of working in an office. This is what joy looks like. Wang Hua's life transformed. Now, I'd like to introduce you to Peter Mays. Peter is the CEO of International China Concern. He's led our work since the April of 2017, and under his leadership, the work of ICC continues to grow and expand. Leading us into new areas. In this interview from our Black Tie Fuzzy Slippers Gala, Peter speaks about the impact of the pandemic on our projects in China, an incredibly heartwarming response of our ICC staff, who displayed an incredible commitment to keep our young children and youth safe. Hi, Peter. Good evening. How are you? I'm very good, Dave. Good to see you. I'm glad that you're dressed up as formally as me here. You know, I wanted to look my best for the <laughs> ICC team. You're looking pretty smooth. That's all I'm going to say. Well, Peter, I know this evening,、uh, a little later on in this evening, some of ICC's leaders are going to be sharing with us about the plans that we have to expand the work, and you're also going to talk a little bit about that. But I thought my starting point this evening may be around a few of the challenges that we faced in recent months. Of course, over the last months, we've watched as COVID nineteen has impacted China, Hong Kong, of course, and then the whole world. Tell us a little bit about how COVID nineteen has specifically impacted the work that we do in China. Well, as you can imagine, Dave, back in February, when the virus was starting to sweep through China, we care for some people who have、um, very serious disabilities, and there many of them are very fragile. So we were very concerned about keeping them safe.、Um, working with the government and the welfare center in Hungyang, we said we have to make a decision to protect them, and we had the volunteers,、uh, uh, the commitment of our volunteers and of our staff、mm. uh, to do whatever it took to be with the kids. And I'm very pleased to say that six months later, no one、uh, in our care and none of the families that we work with has gotten COVID-19. That's absolutely amazing, and Peter, I, I know that our staff who have been incredible. That for some of them, it, it's meant being locked away for forty-five days, not able to see their families or their own children, which is is amazing.、Uh, tell me a little bit about how they coped with that. Well, you can imagine, 
uh, in Hungyang when the decision was made, we're going to lock down. That means either you're in or you're out. And we had, as you said, uh, people who have families and they have to make a decision because at that point, you're not sure how long you're going to be locked in. Right. And they said, right. look, I want to stay with the kids. Mm -hmm. So they moved in and they had to find bed space wherever they could. And everyone just pitched in. Now, at that point, they're not sure how long we're going to be there. Right. And everyone has to respond. But they took this opportunity to say, you know, while we're here, are there any creative new ways that we could serve the children? So they started coming up with new ideas like sensory engagement for the mm. children. So they weren't just sitting there marking time. They were actually proactively becoming even more involved. And I, I love that. I mean, COVID-19, I think, has forced all of us to be more creative in the way we go about the things that we do in, in our work. For example, this Circle of Friends Gala being held as a virtual event this evening. But I love it that our staff, when locked away with the kids, keeping them safe, have also found themselves becoming more creative too. Well, probably it's... Pete, very hard, Peter, I'm sure, for our uh, viewers this evening to, to really get a sense of what it would be like to be locked away. And I know we have a video that we want to share called Behind the Curtain, and it really helps us see what these heroes of the lockdown, that's what I call them, because it's an amazing thing that they've yeah. done. Uh, it helps us see a little bit about what they've went, what, gone through. Let's, let's watch that video now. Today, we are in 现在因为孩子们都要在一起 我们四个人在这里腾干共苦跟这些孩子也接触了也了解孩子的那些生活习惯啊现在稍微要好一些但是再困难我们还是会坚持坚持不搞卫生现在也搞卫生了孩子们个个都兴奋得不得了Peter, it's great to get to see the commitment of ICC staff and how they've been willing to be separated from their families in order to care for ICC's children and keep them safe. Now, I also know that COVID-19 has impacted the costs of providing the care that we give to children in residence and also the families in the community that we support. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, as you can imagine, um, personal protective equipment um, medicines, uh, all kinds of um, uh, methods of making sure that the young people are safe, mm. um, that cost money. Um, also, um, uh, the extra food bill is having all of those people inside. Um, so there's a lot of extra cost involved with making sure that in a situation like this, everyone is completely um, protected. It's definitely worth it. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I know that our Hong Kong uh, donors have been so generous uh, over these months and we so appreciate that, of course. And then, Peter, just move, looking towards the future, can you tell us a little bit about ICC's strategic outlook for the coming year? Oh, I'd love to, Dave. Now, just like the caregivers in China, we're not just sitting back waiting for the virus to blow over. Mm. ICC as an organization has been moving forward with the plans that we have. Uh, we've been given some opportunities by the government. Mm. You're going to be hearing mo a little more later about the families that we work with. Um, not only are the, the children the, who have experienced abandonment in our care, but there's many, many families who are caring for children with, with disabilities, yeah. and they just don't have the support. Right. We have programs you're going to hear more about that we've been expanding this year. Even despite the coronavirus, we've gotten permission from the government to move forward. We've also started on a vocational training program, because even though you see these small children in care, as they grow older, they want to have fulfilling lives, just Absolutely. like everybody watching this um, event. So you want to be able, as you grow older, to have opportunities, to learn skills. And that is part of the vocational training that we're taking uh, undertaking now. That's brilliant. Yeah, I know it's really, it's really exciting for me that despite COVID-19, our work hasn't sort of ground to a halt and gone into maintenance mode. I think, uh, you know, a lot of organizations have had to do that, but we've actually been able to continue to push forward, expanding the programs that we offer, which is very, very exciting. Well, Peter, There's... thank you so much for joining us this evening. We so appreciate the leadership that you bring to the work of ICC and the passion that you have for China's most vulnerable children. Thanks and enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce you to an ICC staff member who has spent the last 17 years of her life sharing her skills as a physiotherapist with the children that ICC serves. Here's my interview with Alison Kennedy, which ends with a song that she wrote and performed for us. G'day. Hi, <laughs> G'day. Hi, Alison. <laughs> Hello. Uh, how are you? I'm very good. I, I love it that you've gone all Aussie for this event tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I have lived with an Australian for 50, over 15 years. Yeah, so. yeah, that's true. Now, I have to ask a question. Do you have your fuzzy slippers on? It's too hot for fuzzy slippers, but I thought I'd give Carib the opportunity to say hi to oh. all of her Australian friends. So, good if, good. If, for those There's of you watching... For those of you watching who don't know who Carib is, this is uh, Kyla and Alison, her roommate's dog, and they adore Carib and Carib adores them. Uh, it's lovely to see Carib tonight. Well, Alison, I know that there are many people watching tonight who haven't had the opportunity to meet you in person. Uh, so why don't you tell us a little bit about your journey into ICC? What brought you from UK, from Sheffield, all the way to China to serve for that length of time? I'd always thought, even before I qualified as a physiotherapist, that there's really useful skills to, to share mm. with people who don't have the opportunity to, to access physiotherapy. It, right. it was 10 years into being, being after I qualified before um, I heard about ICC, and mm. it was through a friend who'd been um, to visit uh, the Changsha Project, right. and he came back and said, oh, they're desperate for therapists, and so I decided I'd go for a month dared myself to go for three months was challenged to go for six months and yeah that was back in 2004 so right that's amazing so it went from one month to three to six and then sort of 15 16 years later you're still here and we so appreciate the work that you do now as you've said you're a physiotherapist which is an amazing skill to bring to the work that we do because obviously so many of our children need physical and occupational therapy um, but I know that in your heart it's not just about doing therapy is it it's it's getting alongside the children tell us a little bit about your approach what your day can look like as you go through our project in Hanyang. Uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I love my job mm. um, I, and I don't take that for granted. I, I, I love the variety. So I, I might start my day um, wearing a panda suit and singing with the kids in circle times. Uh, in the summer, I can finish my day uh, in the swimming pool, splashing mm. around um, and doing therapy. Um, and in the middle there, I, I might be bolting things to wheelchairs or spending time supporting the carers and our local therapists. Mm. And within all of that, I, I um, am very intentional about taking every opportunity and making opportunities to, to help the kids feel valued, mm. help them feel Absolutely. seen and appreciated, because I, I genuinely do appreciate who they are. 
Um, yeah, that might mean stopping in the corridor and just acknowledging their presence. And there's a lot of corridor and a lot of kids. So <laughs> it, it, um, it takes time. So, um, yeah, sometimes the actual therapy, um, yeah, takes second stage to the right. actual personal connections. Absolutely. I think that's so central, isn't it, to what we do in ICC. Yes, we want the children to meet all of their potential. But first and foremost, we want them to know that they're valued, that they're loved, that we, we, we see them as people, not just as, as projects that need to be accomplished. And so mm. I've seen you get down on your knees at eye level with kids just interacting with them and have seen that sort of bond of affection and love that you have. And I, I really so appreciate it. Now, one of the things that a lot of our pe the people watching tonight may not know about you is that you're not just a physiotherapist, but you're also a singer songwriter. And Alison has actually released two CDs and she's written a number of songs for ICC's events over the years. And I know that you've written a song specially for this event tonight. And this is actually kind of the world premiere of that song. Tell us a little bit about the song and what it was that you were wanting to convey through this song and its lyrics. Hmm. Well, the song's called Enough for Today, and uh, I was very aware that there are so many things to be worried about. Mm. Um, yeah, and Jesus said, tomorrow has enough worries of its own. Right, um, absolutely. So there's a line in the song that says, let's leave tomorrow there to wait. Mm. Um, and I was also thinking about Winnie the Pooh. He had a conversation with Piglet. Um, uh, he asked Piglet, what day is it? And Piglet said, it's today. Mm. And Winnie the Pooh responded, oh, my favourite day. <laughs> um, so I hope that as people watch um, and listen to the song, that they're mm. able to get lost in, in the moment of now. Um, leave leave the, the worries there to wait and, yeah. and get lost in the joys of today. Fantastic. That's what a wonderful sentiment to express through this song. Well, Alison, thank you. Please hang around because we're going to come back to you after we've watched and listened to the song together. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's my great pleasure to, that we can share with you tonight Alison's song, Enough for Today. <laughs> Let's play. 
What a great song. Alison, that was just lovely. I really enjoyed hearing that. Um, tell us a little bit about what you would want to say to the people who are watching from Australia tonight. I know you must have a few words you want to share with them. Uh, I, I love you guys, family and mm. friends that feel like family. Um, yeah, you're very close to my heart. I, uh, I wish that um, travel was easier at the moment. Um, mm. I'd love to come and visit and you to visit here, but it's great to be with you and kind of in Australia. Thank you all. Brilliant. Well, Alison, thanks again for that lovely song. Uh, I love seeing you in the panda suit, by the way. I'm not sure if everybody else picked up on that, but I saw it. So uh, anybody who wants to see that, you can go back on the recording later. Take a look at Alison in her panda suit. All right, Alison, take care. God bless you. Lovely to be with you. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. I hope you enjoyed not only hearing Alison's song, but also seeing the images that reinforce that message that there is enough for today. So let's play. And of course, when children play, that's when we get to see the joy that is coming into their lives. It's very easy, isn't it, for all of us to get caught up in worry. But I think that's one of the messages that Jesus gives to us. He carries us through those times. He has us in his hands. So we can find joy in the day rather than it being filled with worry. Well, over the years, ICC has been blessed to have a number of ambassadors that represent the work that we do. One of those ambassadors is Andrea Holmes. Andrea has an amazing story, a little of which we want to share with you tonight. Meet Andrea Holmes. Hello, my name is Andrea Holmes. I'm a Canadian Paralympian and an ambassador to ICC since 2010. It was back in 2010 that I learned about the important work that the ICC is doing in China for the abandoned disabled children. I actually got the opportunity to visit the care facilities in China and see the love and hope and opportunity that these children are being given, which otherwise they would be in a state-run orphanage. And it was quiet and dark and cold and a horrible place to live. I feel so deeply connected to ICC because I am half Chinese and I was born with a disability. I was born missing the lower portion of my leg and I wear a prosthetic to function in daily life. My goal was to represent Canada in the 2004 Paralympic Games in long jump and I was actually able to realize that goal. Being born in Canada has a lot of privilege and being able to strive for such ambitious goals is something I feel so grateful for. These children in China, their goals may be much simpler to just go to school and feel loved. I think in a time of COVID, it doesn't matter if your family is blood or your family is just love and what you make it to be. Feeling connection and feeling close to people is what matters the most. The work that ICC is doing is truly changing the lives of children in China. And I implore you to dig deep and give generously tonight because the work that the ICC is doing for these abandoned disabled children is changing lives. And more importantly now than ever, we can give love, hope and opportunity to the children of China. Thank you very much. I'm sure you'll agree with me that Andrea is a remarkable woman who has faced tremendous challenges and yet has been able to overcome them because of her family and the community that has supported her. My next interview is with someone who I met many years ago. Kyla Alexander first came to China on an ICC team. 21 years later, she's still serving with ICC as our China Operations Director. Enjoy my interview with Kyla. Hi Kyla. Hi Dave, how are you? I'm good, how are you? It's nice to see you. I'm good. Yeah, good. I'm good. Have yeah. you got your fuzzy slippers on? Alison said it was too hot for her. Yeah, it's too hot. The panda's got slippers on though. <laughs> <Yeah>. Okay, <laughs> well, 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 we'll we'll take that. Uh, Kyla, you and I have known each other for, for many, many years, both as colleagues and of course as, as friends as well. And, you know, it's obviously been a real delight to get to know you and to work with you over these years. But there are probably people on this live stream tonight that have never had the opportunity to meet you. And so, again, would you just take a moment and share a little bit about your journey and how you came into the work of ICC? Yeah, well, it all started in 1999 when a, a, a friend, a colleague, she may be watching, Lisa Animat, invited me to go with her to China on an mm. ICC team. And of course, I had an inkling of a call at that point. So I said, no, no <laughs> way. 
<laughs> I was a bit scared to cross that line. Absolutely. Uh, but in a series of different events, um, God very clearly called me on that mm. team. And during that team, my heart was broken open by what I saw mm. and my mind was completely changed. And I went back to Australia to, yeah, to basically pack up my life and move back to China. And, and I ended up back there in January 2001 and the rest is history. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Well, I know over the last 19 years, you have obviously worked hands on with many of the children that we serve. First of all, you learned to speak Chinese, which, of course, is an incredible undertaking. Uh, then secondly, you worked managing our foster care program as we were developing that. You've run our short term teams program, which is the program where we have people come volunteer from all over the world with ICC. But I think it's been the last 15 years where you have really just seen just incredible blessing come. And that, of course, has been as you you and your team have pioneered ICC's work in Hanyang. Tell us a little bit about the vision that you have for the children that we serve in Hanyang and of course broadly in Changsha as well. Yeah, it's our hope and our dream that our children through receiving, through love, hope and opportunity will just flourish to their, in their God-given potentials mm. and that they'll be able to give love and to receive love and through, and they'll receive the necessary supports like special education, therapy, yeah. Um, and vocational training that will allow them to flourish and to know that they're worthy and to know that they're worth our time. Mm. Yeah, I think that's so important, isn't it? Every child, no matter whether they're in a family or, of, of course, even more so if they've gone through the pain of abandonment, needs to know that they're worthy, that their life is precious. And I think, you know, mm. that's one of the things mm. I love about the work we do in ICC. It's not just about delivering services, but it's really about helping a child to find that place that they can belong, a family that they can belong to. But of course, yes. we know that across welfare centers uh, in China, that there are still tens of thousands of children that don't have access to the kind of care that ICC provides. Tell us a little bit about what life is like for children in a welfare center where there isn't someone like ICC helping out and bringing change. Uh, well, when a child is abandoned and found, they're taken usually to a institution mm. and that institution is, is exactly that. It's very institutional. There's not yeah. enough caregivers. Um, the ratios of caregivers to staff is very low. Nobody knows the child's name. Nobody right. knows the child's special needs. They all have very um, high needs, uh, very specialized needs, but nobody understands them and knows them. Yeah. And then people don't have the time to understand their needs because there's such a limit in the staffing levels. Right. And so that has a very different outcome for every single child. For some of them, it might mean a very long, lonely existence. For right. others, it can mean very severe malnutrition and even death. And and the, yeah, as I said, the outcome can be very different depending on, on the child. But those are the children that we take in and we care for. Yeah, and it's, it is sobering. And of course, many of the people watching tonight will never have seen anything like that. I know I saw it, you know, in 1993, 94, when ICC first began, that was what broke my heart. That's what changed my life. It's what put me on the pathway to beginning the work of ICC and the work that we do today. And I, you know, it was, it was tragic to me to see little babies, toddlers that should have had a life full of joy and a life full of energy and fun just lying and wasting away on beds in welfare centers in China. You know, that, that changed my entire life. And I, I know it's, it's something that we want to share with people, not because it's hopeless. We don't want to kind of make people feel sad and depressed, but we want people to understand the reality of the situation. But it is hard to understand unless you've seen it. So Kyla, we have a video coming up uh, where we're gonna be showing um, some photos, before and after photos. So about six months ago, ICC had 18 new children come in from welfare centers into our work. We had photos of those children when they first came from the welfare center. And we're gonna to get to show you those photos and you can see what it's like for a child that has been neglected and unloved and maybe even never had a toy to play with. And then we're gonna show you just six months later after being under the care of ICC, the transformation that's taken place. So let's take a look at that video now.
Wow, those photos just show incredible transformation. And you know, uh, seeing that seeing Jinshio's face there, the last little boy, you, you can see in the first photo just sort of the sadness and the heaviness of the situation that he's come out of. And then six months later, you see this radiant smile and it, it really does melt your heart. It's, it's pretty incredible, isn't it? Mm, it sure is. Yeah. Mm. Kyla, now I know that there are many challenges in the work that you do. Working in China isn't easy. Uh, it's, it's hard doing the kind of work that we do when you're living in the midst of these kind of challenging situations. But I also know that you see a lot of joy. And this, of course, is the theme of our evening. Come and see what joy looks like. So I'd love to hear maybe a story from you of one child where you have really experienced joy and where you've seen joy come into the life of that child. Mm. Yeah, I sure do get to experience joy every single day. Mm. Uh, but I guess the story I'd like to tell you about is this little girl, and her name is Joy. Her name is Lula, right. and that means joy. And she came into our care when she, she was two years old. And she was like a newborn baby. She was tiny. She was very malnourished, very extended abdomen. Mm. Her arms hung, hung just to hang at her side like little sticks. And she just looked at us with her big eyes and her expression. And the, we delivered her um, into the care of uh, one of our group homes and our carers got around her, getting to know her needs, understanding her, um, her very specialized nutrition needs, her very specialized feeding needs. And they just nurtured her and loved her. And she slowly but surely came to life. Mm. It took longer than six months. Mm. Um, but at the age of three, she started to, to say a few words and started to say mama. And then at the age of four, she started to first walk on her own independently and two months ago at the age of five she's just started to feed herself independently but the most the most wonderful thing about her is her love of life and she's mm. so rambunctious and <laughs> I was swimming with her in the pool the other day and she's splashing everybody and shouting and and she's just full of joy yeah, and that... to think this little girl from came from the the brink of, of death uh, to now this wonderful life and giving life to others is mm. just such a blessing and a joy to watch and to see and to experience every day. Kyla, that is a really wonderful story. I was just looking there as you were telling the story at that photograph of her being held by our caregivers. And it, it, it just hit me again that she was two years old at that point, And yet she looks like she's just a few months old. And that's, I suppose, the result of neglect and, and malnutrition, lack of care. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. And just the trauma of abandonment yeah. and the trauma of, of her early years. Yeah. yeah, that's amazing. Well, it's wonderful to see the transformation in that last photo, to see that beautiful young girl. So thank you for sharing that story. It's lovely. Now, of course, little girls like Lulla go from uh, babies to toddlers, toddlers to kids, to, uh, and then into teenagers and adolescents and then adults. And that's a whole journey. And obviously, as we walk that journey with children like Lulla and, and hundreds of other children, we don't just think about the now, but we also think about the future. Um, and I know we, we try to build initiatives in ICC that not only bring joy into the lives of the children, but really open them up to the future and give them the trajectory towards fulfilling their potential. Is there a, a, a new initiative that you could share with us that, that kind of will build joy into the lives as they head towards adolescence and adulthood? Yeah, so we're starting to renovate the Lighthouse building, which is a building that we, we have in Changsha. Mm. And we're going to turn it into a vocational and life skills training center for young people with disabilities who, who are maybe abandoned and in the system or maybe who are from their families but need hope and need um, to learn in a relational setting mm. so that they can then go out into the workforce, find jobs, or maybe just become better contributors in their own home and family life. And, and, and yeah, just to give them worth and, and just to allow their God-given potential to, to just come out mm. and to bless the world because um, these kids can be a blessing to the world. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, when we see, uh, like the very first video, we saw Wang Hua's story, mm. and we see the mm. blessing that she's become, that she's now part, yeah. a vibrant part of this team working in an office. I mean, that, that to me is just a great yeah. example of what we are hoping to achieve through this project that you've just shared with us about. Well, thanks, Kyla. Lovely to have you with us tonight. Really appreciate you. You've been such a blessing to the work of ICC over so many years. You continue to bless us through the leadership that you bring. I mean, it, it is just amazing. So have a good rest of your evening. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Take care. See you later. All right, bye-bye.
It's great to hear Kyla's stories and to hear about Lulla and the transformation that is taking place in Lulla's life. Now I'm going to introduce you to our second ICC ambassador. This ambassador is a world-renowned violinist that has a very personal connection to the work that ICC does. It's my pleasure to introduce this ambassador moment with Miss Ning Kam. Hello, my name is Ning Kam, and I am a violinist as well as the Professor of Music at the Royal Conservatory of Brussels and at the Yehudi Menuhin School in the UK. I am also an International China Concern Ambassador since 2012. Back in 2012, I went to visit to see firsthand the work that ICC was doing in Hengyang, China. It was astonishing and overwhelming to say the least to see um, the challenges that the children there had to face with issues of abandonment, disability and a lack of support. And it was incredible to see what ICC was doing with them. I believe that children are made in the image of God and that every child's life is precious. Four years ago, I had my second son, Nathan. And after he was born, we found out that Nathan has Down syndrome. Now here in the UK, Nathan has the support of a loving family, an extended loving family, as well as an amazing health system that the UK provides for children with Down syndrome. To think that if he had been born in China, it would have been a very, very different story. And it really made us realize how much more we have to be doing for the families in China and for ICC to support children such as Nathan. Mm. So with that in mind, I would like to ask you to donate to the work of ICC by clicking on the link below. And as you're doing so, I would like to play you a little something so that you can enjoy and can I play you a little something, Nathan? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Go! Ninkam and her husband are raising their families surrounded by a community of people that want them to succeed. They also, of course, have the great support system provided by the UK government, all of which Ning and her family is so grateful for. Families in China, however, often find themselves struggling and increasingly desperate and isolated because they don't have access to such services. Twelve years ago, ICC established a programme to assist these families providing therapy, special education and social work support. It's called the Family Partners Programme, or FPP for short. In this next video, you'll meet David Bondi and the FPP team and see some of the amazing work that they're doing. Every day, Tanjir Guo's father carries him downstairs from their home on the sixth floor of a Changsha apartment building 
down to the busy street where Mr. Tan has a little shop. Tan Jirguo is 16 years old. He has cerebral palsy that limits his ability to move and communicate. Caring for their son has been extremely challenging for the Tans. The Tans are just one of more than 100 families that the Family Partners Program is helping right now. Some families include parents struggling to make ends meet while they care for a child with a severe disability. In other families, grandparents are doing their best to care for a child after the parents have abandoned their responsibility. People like Mrs. Ha, who was determined to care for her granddaughter Lala when no one else would. This child was so miserable, but she's still a precious life. You couldn't just give her up. So I didn't care what others said. I never gave up. Jia Jia's parents aren't around either, so his 70-year-old grandparents do their best to care for him and his five-year-old sister. Each day, Jia Jia's grandmother takes him to the FPP service center where he receives special education and one on one therapy. The journey is two hours each way, but it's worth it because the results are significant. Whether providing programs and classes in our service center or visiting families in their homes, FPP is giving life-changing tools and support to people who desperately need it. David Bondi and his team have been working with Jirguo on a regular basis. They helped him get a wheelchair, and therapists have trained his parents on ways to keep their son in good health. The young man now has the potential to start using computers to communicate and explore his world. Families all across the nation of China that have children with disabilities are facing the same kind of challenges as the families that you've just seen in the video that we were watching. I'd like to introduce to you David Bondi. David is the director of ICT's Family Partners Program, and he's dedicated himself to helping families such as the ones that you saw in this video. Will you join me in welcoming David Bondi? Hi, David. Welcome to the Black Tie and Fuzzy Slippers Ball. David, in the video that we just saw, we saw families going through some very, very real struggles and challenges. Can you share with us a little bit about the vision that you have for these families and specifically for the Family Partners Program? Well, David, quite simply for FPP, our vision is that there would be hope in the hearts of every Chinese family that's raising a child with a disability, because for many of these families, it's just not there. Yeah. And I know that these families, they really don't have any kinds of support at all. And that sometimes the level of struggle and desperation actually causes families to fall apart. Tell me a little bit more about what families experience. What's it like for a family that has a child with a disability when they don't have any kind of support system like the Family Partners Program? Yes, they're very, very isolated. And, and frankly, it's the opposite of what we want to see. There's no hope for them. The past is painful because that's where the disability came from. The present is difficult and the future is very bleak. There's really no hope that tomorrow is going to be any different than today for these families. Yeah, and I know in the work that you do, obviously you're going into homes, uh, you're meeting with families all the time, you're going in with, with your FPP teams, the Family Partner Program teams, which perhaps you can tell us a little bit about. Tell us about those teams, tell us about the impact that they have, and maybe share with us some stories of families that you have seen go through some transformation through the work that the uh, Family Partners Program does. Sure, so currently we have two uh, what we call cross-care teams. There's a special educator, a therapist, and a social work worker on each team. They go into each family's home and meet with the family, figure out what the needs are, and they make a plan for helping them make measurable progress toward a better future. And that makes a huge difference. So there's a few uh, examples I wanted to share this evening. Uh, first of all, we've got Lilla and her grandmother, Mrs. Hu. And Lilla was abandoned at the welfare center by her parents because she had too many medical challenges. She has cerebral palsy. But grandma went to the orphanage, got her out and said, I'm going to raise this girl 
as my own on 600 RMB a month and she's done it. And Lola is a bright and shiny 12 year old with grandma by her side. It's a wonderful story. Uh, Dong Dong um, has got uh, Down syndrome and he's the third child of believing parents, but the dad just said, I can't do it. I want you to get rid of him. Uh, and the mom said, no, I'm not gonna let him go. And so wow. we've just seen so much life change in just a short time with Dong Dong. He's making incredible progress and uh, the lights come on and mom and then the little sister's getting involved in his education as well. Oh, that's great. Yeah, the third story is very dramatic. Um, you've got a mom who has a, a little five-year-old who, uh, as best we can tell, is through a bad uh, immunization that caused him to become disabled, then they had corrective surgery that actually made it worse to where he couldn't mm -hmm. walk. He's got an older brother who's 12 with Asperger's. The dad couldn't cope, divorced the mom, and then within a, within a year, both grandparents passed away. So she was alone in the world when we came upon her, and there were many tears shed in the initial assessment but in just six to eight months we've seen dramatic change the lights come on for her fun fun's walking she wow. was able to actually give his walker to another family because she doesn't amazing. need it anymore i mean it's just amazing things are happening and it's all because of our dedicated professionals on the ground uh, that are serving. david i i just love hearing these stories um you know when you hear stories of, of kids and families now being transformed through the work that family partners program is doing it's super encouraging and i know that this is a really important part of ICC's work. We have a strong vision to grow this part of our work. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about some of the new initiatives they're gonna be rolling out over the coming months. Well, we've, we're currently serving 190 plus families with our program. We've got a list from the local government for 200 more families. Mm -hmm. In addition, we've got plans to open up two new locations within the next six to 12 months, one in another city. Um, we'd like to add two to three teams within the next six months so we've got ambitious plans and we've got a lot of momentum. The government's behind us and we just need partners, partners like the people that are going to be viewing uh, this meeting that you've put together, David. So really what you're saying is that we have the opportunity to impact hundreds and hundreds more families to bring them that sense of hope, to bring them a sense of practical support and for them to really thrive instead of just surviving. And that, that really is absolutely amazing. Uh, David, there are a lot of people watching this event tonight, and I'm sure they've been super interested to hear what you've had to share. Are there any words that you'd specifically like to say to them? Well, first of all, I'd just like to say thank you for your partnership to, up to this point. It's essential. And I just want you to know that there's an inc a golden opportunity just waiting for us to invest in. We've got staff, we've got favor, we've got families, and we've got unlimited opportunity to change lives because our vision is much, much bigger than just one location. Our vision's national. We want to see every Chinese family with hope in their hearts, and you can be the change agent tonight. Well, as the founder of ICC, you know, um, these are the kind of dreams that I carried in my heart when I first began ICC 27 years ago, not just for the children of welfare centers, but for families to be strong and to be healthy, despite them having to deal with sometimes very challenging situations. And David, it's a privilege to get to partner with you uh, as you serve in ICC so that we can see those vision become reality. Thanks so much, David, for joining us tonight. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. I'm sure you agree that the work being done by the Family Partners Programme is bringing real change for families that are in desperate need of support. David shared with us how we plan to grow this programme so that we can reach even more families. These families are waiting for assistance. They're waiting for a lifeline. And that's something that we together can give them. Now, in ICC, we're blessed to have many people around the world that support the work that we do. I want to share a partner moment with you and introduce Carrie Leoganda. Carrie is a Canadian businesswoman that I met many years ago and who's been an incredible supporter of the work of ICC. Meet Carrie. Hi, I'm Carrie Leoganda. I own a financial planning firm here in Richmond, Canada. How I get in touch with ICC? Actually, it was many years ago when my daughter Natalie finished her high school, actually finished university, she requested a graduation trip to China to visit ICC. By that time, I have no idea what exactly ICC had been doing in China. When she came back, I just asked her, how was the trip? And then she told me, mom is very, very meaningful. I encourage you, if you want to know more about ICC, you and dad have to go there yourself. So me and my husband Gideon decided to go there. The rest is history. When we went there, we were so touched by 
the work and the ministry that ICC have been doing there. They were taking care of those special needs children. And I know that it's never easy to take care of those children. Why? Because I have a special needs child. Natalie was actually born without hearing and have some vision impairment. The fact that she can grow now and um, being a mother of two is just amazing. But it takes a village. It takes many hard work from people that are surround her to love her and to provide her opportunities. And that's exactly what ICZ has been doing in China. So from then onwards, we start to support ICC. And also not only that we support ICC, that we encourage our friends and encourage our relatives to continue to help supporting them. Because you know, this is such a wonderful ministry and everybody who has been contributing to this good cause all are very being encouraged by them. So tonight I encourage you to click on the link below there and give generously to support this wonderful ministry. Thank you. As we come to the end of our time together, I want to take this opportunity to express my gratitude to all of you that support the work that ICC does. When you get involved and give, it isn't just our work, it becomes your work too. You are making a difference. To our new friends, I hope this presentation has given you a clearer understanding of the work that we do as you consider how you may want to support this closing song that you're about to hear was also written by Alison Kennedy a few years ago. The name of the song is Your Love Brings Life. Perhaps as you hear this song, you may want to think a little bit about your response. It isn't, of course, just about being generous with our finances. It's also about expressing our love, our care for those children that are vulnerable and in need. And letting that love that we express bring life to China's most vulnerable children and families that are waiting for help. i
want to thank you so much for the time that you've spent with us. I hope that you've seen not only the challenges that China's most vulnerable children face, but more importantly, the joy that they can experience when we come together to make a difference. I'll give the last words to our staff and children in China. Thank you. So let's play. Thank you. 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 Thank you.